Welcome to Washington. I'm Laura Ingram, and this is the Ingram Angle. A fantastic Friday lineup for you this evening, of course. The culture wars are back on, and ahead we're going to discuss rapper Kanye West's late-night defense of his pro-Trump views. In the kneeling debate, once again, roiling the NFL, of course. Plus, how the left purposefully manipulates the words of our 40th president, Ronald Reagan. Cabinet member Bill Bennett and Reagan biographer Craig Shirley will explain. And a can't-miss interview coming up later in the hour. The Philadelphia U.S. Attorney standing up to the Philadelphia District Attorney, the issue, the city's sanctuary policy. Stay with us for this one. You're going to love it. Plus, we begin tonight with the new details of contact between officials at the highest level of the Obama-era Justice Department and that former British spy. Long after the FBI cut ties with this Christopher Steele character and the Trump dossier author, well, what happened? Bruce Orr, who was at the time a senior Justice Department official, continued to maintain extensive contact with Steele. He wasn't supposed to. This according to new emails Fox News has obtained. Bruce Orr's new connection to this whole sordid affair is only made worse when you consider the connection of his wife, Nellie. Now, Fox News has already confirmed that she worked for that outfit, Fusion GPS, during the 2016 election, explicitly hired to help investigate Trump and Russia-related subjects. And if you think the Trump legal team isn't following all of this, well, think again. Here's counsel to the president, Jay Sekulow. She had the number four at the United States Department of Justice. The number four. His wife happens to work for Fusion GPS, who happens to be retained to put together the dossier with Chris Steele. And Chris Steele happens to be talking to the FBI and to uh, Bruce Orr, the number four at the Justice Department. Christopher Steele gets fired for leaking information, yet Bruce Orr continues the ongoing dialogue. Unbelievable. In a moment, we're going to show you what could be false testimony that Fu Fusion GPS's Glenn Simpson gave to House investigators last year. But first, I want to bring in our powerful legal panel to break this all down. In Miami, Guy Lewis, a former U.S. attorney. In South Carolina, James Trusty, a former DOJ attorney in the criminal division. And here with me in studio, Robert Driscoll, a former deputy assistant attorney general. Welcome to all of you. Robert, let's start with this new information. I mean, Christopher Steele was not to have contact with the FBI after they had to disassociate themselves from him when he, against policy, right. was leaking information to the press. Now it turns out, from these emails that were discovered, that wasn't the case. He had ongoing uh, contact with members of the FBI, uh, including from, well, from August all the way through into 2017. Right. Yeah, and I think what's a little more disturbing is that his wife was working for Fusion GPS. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say the contact continues. Bruce Orr's wife from the Bruce FBI. Bruce Orr's wife. So, some people, you know, maintain contact with colleagues even after they're cut off or something like that. But where his wife had an interest in the Fusion GPS research getting pushed, the fact that Orr is the one that was involved in this is a little bit disturbing. Um, I think they're calling hearings next week sometime to determine, you know, kind of whether anything substantive was said or done, but certainly it's troubling. Um, yeah, Bob Goodlatte, one, well, Bob Goodlatt wants to bring everybody back. And right. Guy, let's go to you on this. Uh, it seems like getting information, key pieces of information out of the Justice Department is, it, I mean, pulling teeth, pulling taffy, whatever you want to say, it's really difficult. But the information kind of trickles out slowly. How conceivable is it that Bruce Orr didn't know what his wife was working on at Fusion GPS, the connection between Rush, uh, Trump and any Russian-related topics? Laura, not, not at all. I mean, come on. The, these guys, Orr and his wife, they shouldn't be touching anything on this with a 10-foot pole. It's so clear to me that there's a conflict, that there's an appearance of impropriety. They shouldn't have anything to do, um, w they shouldn't have had anything to do with this investigation, with this case, any submission to the FISA court, any of that business. And they know this. That's my problem. And, and, and I don't understand. I hope Congress continues to, 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 look, I love the Justice Department. I'm a product of the Justice Department. But they, Congress needs to continue to beat them over the head for more transparency. More transparency. That's what this case needs. Uh, James, your reaction to all these latest developments? 
Yeah, it's a huge red flag, Laura. I mean, I was with DOJ 17 years, seven in D.C., and I, I can't for the life of me figure out any good explanation for why Bruce, who I know, was sitting down with a decommissioned informant. And then to add to that, that the FBI had people there writing up 302 reports. I mean, it sounds like they had decommissioned this informant and fully intended to keep using him. That's one aspect of it that's troublesome. The other is to go back to the FISA warrants. The FISA warrants said, we the FBI speculate that maybe this was a politically motivated dossier, and they swear off that Christopher Steele knew that. Now, I just don't understand how Steele could be having these meetings with Bruce, with Bruce's connection to Fusion GPS, and not likely know that there was a Hillary Clinton campaign source for the funding of the dossier. So again, big questions, still a lot to unravel, but absolutely red flags in terms of this process. Yeah, I want to I want to go back to a January 31st, uh, 2017 text exchange, which we just uh, got our hands on. And this is but this is um, remember the FBI specifically instructed Steele he could no longer operate or obtain any intelligence whatsoever. Yet Steele asks Orr in this exchange if he could continue to help feed information to the FBI, saying just want to check you are okay still in the situ situation and be able to help locally as discussed along with your bureau colleagues. I'm still here to help as discussed or texted back. I'll let you know if that changes. Steele replies, if you end up though, I really need another bureau contact point number who is briefed. We can't allow our guy to be forced to go back home. It would be disastrous. Now investigators, Robert, are trying to figure out who our guy is. Again, this is Steele, yep. have, who is not to have contact with the FBI, in contact with Bruce Orr, whose yep. wife works for Fusion GPS. Yep. Who's our guy? We can't, we can't allow our guy to be forced to go home. It would be disastrous. Must be some guy in the Justice Department, I would think. It, it, it certainly appears that way. I, I fear there'll be a failure of memory. Yeah. Where uh, you know people will say, "My God, I sent thousands and thousands of texts. I just can't remember what that one was referring to." But it certainly appears that that I mean, again, it appears that there's an operation. I mean, you'd like to give people the benefit of the doubt and say, "Okay, maybe they were texting about baseball or something after the fact. There was some contact." But those emails, again, are pretty pretty damning. Text exchanges, yeah. I mean, you know, it's, that I've got I got to go. I got to go to you. Uh, and, uh, and, and this, I find this to be a, another out, a, amazing development this week. There's been a lot of drama in the Paul Manafort trial. I know you've been following the ins and outs of what's happening with Judge Ellis. The special counsel Bob Mueller's team filing a formal complaint against the courtroom behavior of Judge Ellis. Uh, the prosecution writing, "quote." The court's reprimand of government counsel suggested to the jury incorrectly that the government had acted improperly and in contravention of court rules. This could prejudice. Uh, this prejudice should be cured. Uh, let's go to you, guy, you guy about this. I mean, I've known Judge Ellis just <laughs> casually. I mean, he's a cantankerous kind of old-style judge. But there seems to be a real effort, in my view, to kind of smear him now because he's been tough on the Mueller team. What's your take here? No, I, uh, there, I agree, Laura. Look, you clerked for the Second Circuit. You clerked for Justice Thomas. You do not, prosecutors, you don't win fights with federal judges. And you don't try to pick fights with federal judges. Look, I, I, I don't mind that the prosecutors are being aggressive, that they're standing up for their position. I don't know if I would have filed something like that and instead probably would have asked for a sidebar and said, hey, Judge, you know, you, you told the jury, you said something yesterday. I'm not sure it was correct. Could you remind the jury that what you say is not evidence and, and you don't have an opinion in this case? That's probably how I would have handled it as the prosecutor. James, one of the uncomfortable exchanges, and there are many during the past few days. I'm sorry, but some of it is just entertaining. It, it, let's just say that. <laughs> There's one point where Judge Ellis thinks that Greg Andres, who of course is one of the lawyers for Mueller, is not looking at him. And so the judge says, <laughs> I'm here, Mr. Andres, is like, I'm here from the bench. Andres says, I'm sorry, Judge, I'm listening. And Ellis says, I know, but when you look down, it's as if to say, you know, that's BS. I don't want to listen to you any, any more from you. Andres says, Judge, you continue to interpret our reactions in some way. We don't do that to you, and we're not being disrespectful in any way. Ellis says, all right, then look at me. <laughs> and he kind of, 
I mean, James, he kind of apologized, I guess, was it yesterday, for his thing, you know, well, things get kind of out of hand, I guess. But wh what do you make of all this? It's just this kind of normal back and forth. I mean, I certainly, when I was pressing cases, I would not have taken the judge to task for reprimanding, not in the way they did, but they, they kind of feel like they have, a, you know, they have a head of steam against the judge. Well, they've, they've had a tough go at it. He's been very intrusive. He's been very opinionated. I mean, it's starting to sound like he's going to send Greg to bed with no dinner at this point. <laughs> but, uh, but the bottom line is, you, know, you have to keep, a, keep in mind procedurally, if you're a defense attorney and you're getting kind of heckled from the bench during the trial, you actually have a remedy someday. You take it up to a higher court and you say, we didn't get a fair trial because he was making me look like an idiot in front of the jury. If you're a prosecutor and the case goes on and gets to be a, an acquittal, then you had no recourse. You can't go back and say we got an unfair trial. So your recourse is either you take it or you file something or find some way to address it with the court. And I think they just hit a critical mass where they say we're just going to have to take this on more publicly, not a sidebar, tell the judge, hey, here's a couple of instances where you're demonstratively yeah. wrong, which he was, and try to get him to, to kind of step back a little bit. Um, so it's a, well, it's a tough spot for a litigant to be in, but I'm not really uh, critical of the fact they filed a motion because it's now or never. I mean, did... Didn't he kind of make that poor Greg Andres cry? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but you have to have your big boy <laughs> pants on when you're before Judge Ellis. He's, he's a tough judge. Um, the, also, no, another thing that happened today, and Robert, I want to get your take on this. There was a mysterious recess this morning at about, I think it was like 10.50 or so. Uh, they had like a, uh, uh, a sidebar. Mm -hmm. Then it was a recess. No uh, one, it was not explained. Yep. Then they readjourned after two. Yep. And then they started talking about how Rick Gates uh, took out a loan, I guess, for $200,000 for, you know, sports tickets. Right. I mean, is, is that normal to have that you start in the morning, you have a recess for four hours, and you come back? Maybe Ellis just wanted to cool things down? Uh, it's, it, it's just speculation because we don't know. But what, what, I, what I've heard around the, the courthouse and from other people I know down there is it may have been a jury issue. Yeah. Because when he left, he didn't go... It was go, under seal. Like, he, Tom, yeah, he, didn't go back, he didn't go back to Chambers. He went in the direction of the jury room. He didn't go out the Chambers ah. door. He went in the same direction as the jury box or the jury room. So there, there yeah. may have been a jury issue that he was talking to them about. Either someone read a newspaper or someone, ah, you know what I mean? But it's under seal, so we don't know. So but we it was, don't know. But of course, I'm watching it like minute by minute what's happening. Right. People are doing a great job of blogging about this. I was like, wait a second, it stopped. I need this to keep going on. It's very, right. I wish it was in the courtroom. It's actually really fascinating. All right, finally, guys, I want to get everyone's thoughts on whether President Trump will actually finally sit down for an interview with Mueller's team or whether Mueller will have to issue a subpoena and everything that that entails. Uh, let's go to you, Robert, on this. Oh, sorry, Robert. I want to go to James. I just went to you. James, go ahead. All right. Well, and uh, look, I don't think Mueller himself feels like he has that strong a hand to issue a subpoena here, or at least to get the kind of compliance he wants. Why? There's a lot of layers of, well, there's a lot of layers of why the president shouldn't have to face a subpoena while in office, but, you know, executive privilege kicks in, um, and, and frankly, the fact that they've called the president a subject makes it very tough for me to understand how they could ask questions about obstruction, because the obstruction angle is purely target. So I, I think what they're looking at is, what are our chances if we actually subpoena him? We are going to get a motion to quash. What's it going to read like? And I think a motion to quash filed by the White House would be pretty damning and pretty powerful in terms of addressing everything they want to complain about when it comes to the Mueller probe up until you know, calling him a subject but treating him like a target. Guy, is there any way that the special counsel will accept the terms that Trump's legal team offered? Laura, not in a million years. Um, the, the president will never sit down uh, voluntarily and speak to these guys. Uh, he'd be crazy to. Um, the special counsel, I think, Bob is tough as a nail. He's, he's hard as a rock. He'll uh, issue the grand jury subpoena and then they'll file their motion wow. to quash and it'll make its way up through the Supreme Court. Well, Eventually, that's gonna, that, that's gonna be, we're going to have you guys back a lot when that happens because that's going to go on for some time. Fantastic conversation, guys. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. And if you heard heads exploding across Hollywood last night, there's one good reason. Kanye West just doubled down on his support for Donald Trump. As a musician, uh, African-American, guy out in Hollywood, all these different things, you know, everyone around me tried to pick my candidate for me mm -hmm. and then told me every time I said I like Trump that I couldn't say it out loud or 
my career would be over, I'd get kicked out of the black community because blacks are, we're supposed to have a monolithic thought, we can only like, we can only be Democrats and all. What it represented to me is not about policies and because I'm, I'm not a politician like that, but it represent it represented overcoming fear and doing what you felt, no matter what anyone said and saying, you can't bully me. Liberals can't bully me, news can't bully me, the hip hop community, they can't bully me. Remarks from Kanye West on Jimmy Kimmel last night are giving a new bout of agita to liberals and Hollywood. The rapper, of course, sparked a meltdown among the left earlier this year after proclaiming his support for President Trump. And clearly he's got no plans to stop fighting against the anti-Trump groupthink and, as he said, the bullying of the entertainment industry. Joining us now to analyze all this is radio talk show host Kevin Jackson and Eric Johnson is a civil rights attorney. Eric, uh, let's start with you. Kanye West, okay. I mean, he's, a, he's an interesting cat, interesting character. Uh, he has a huge following. And Very much I so. Yeah, I find, it, I find it just fascinating that it's controversial for someone to say, I think for myself, you won't put words in my mouth, you won't tell me how to, what to believe or for whom to vote. I'm my own person. Somehow that's a point of controversy in the group think that is the entertainment industry today. And I think he's just smashing the stereotype and I think it's freaking people out. Your reaction? Well, I don't think it's freaking people out. I mean, I think Kanye is trying to play both sides of the fence. He's always been a free thinker. I mean, long, long time ago he stood up on national TV and said George Bush didn't care about black people. So he's always had a free thinker on himself. What he's trying to do right now is really cater to both sides of the fence. He wants to maintain the fact that he does support Trump, but he wants to do it in such a way that could possibly appease his, his followers who may not support Trump. So really it seems like more of a tactical marketing skill on his behalf rather than some instances of bullying. I mean, he's a multi-millionaire. There's no way he can feel bullied about who he chooses to vote for. Well, Sorry, you know what I mean. I mean, let's go to Kevin on this. Kevin, uh, you understand what this is ultimately Absolutely. all about. Is, is that there's a certain subset of the American political world that says if you are of a certain background, of a certain ethnicity, certain uh, race, there's only one direction you can go in, Absolutely. and whether it's you know whether it's Clarence Thomas or whether it's uh, you know Walter Williams or Tom Sowell or or any given number of of, of free thinkers out there, you, they're vilified in some way. Yep. They're vilified, and Kevin, yep. I I find it to be a fascinating conversation. It is, and it isn't just uh, entertainment, Laura, the way you set it up. It's the black community that will ostracize you, and Kanye got it right. You will be bullied, and he, got, he named everybody in the mix. The liberals will oh, bully you, the not. media will bully you, guys like this guy will bully you. Look, Kanye said what he said. There was no upside for him in this. He wasn't catering to any particular side. What Kanye said is, I'm a human being. I'm going to think for myself. I'm not going to let anybody determine what I say as a man, and good for him. And so, and, the impact, and everyone else the thinks for themselves. Is, I, I let you talk. The impact has been felt because not only has Donald Trump raised his, his the black, level of black support, I doubled mean, it's it. a twenty, it doubled it. It's at twenty nine percent now because people are finally starting to wake up. Kanye brought a level of consciousness to many blacks in America who feel identically the same. Look, I've been a, a conservative my entire life, so I don't know what that wake up means, but there are many people who need a Kanye to say something like that. And it is bu the bullying that the left tells you that they don't want to do, but they are the biggest bullies on the planet. Eric. Well, they're not bullies just because they disagree. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is there's not a disagreement with the Republican Party per se, but more so some of the policies that the black community feels that have not been in their best interest. If Kanye wishes to align himself with that, the issue is if he's aligning himself with policies that most of the African-American community don't support, right, but, that's know, a I, reality of the yeah. situation. Not the I case. Think, I, yeah, I think that, you know, whether it's the, the violence in Chicago, how it, it had a huge spike under Democratic leadership under Rahm Emanuel, where it's a Democrat, you know, is a protege of Obama, but things have gotten worse. And you see the African American community in the hardest hit neighborhoods saying, We want new leadership. It's Absolutely. not working. And but they're Laura, open me, to me, talking to people. They're Laura, open. Me, I, don't, I don't think it's me, an let issue me respond of the Democratic to one other, let thing let me in Chicago. To one other. No, no, no. I'm, you talked earlier. Well, look, it is an issue. Kanye West was threatened. The black conservatives like myself, we get threatened all the time. 
I have never threatened anybody that differs from me politically, and I never will. We can disagree. I mean, maybe because you haven't, that does not no, mean it, it that has, liberals it has are nothing not to do with that. You, and people you who said, have different you said views Kanye are not threatened West, either. You said Kanye yeah. West hasn't been threatened. He's been threatened personally. There were rappers that came out and said, you have a concert, we're going to be there. A guy who was a crip said he wanted to kill him. That's the vitriol that happens on the other side. Yeah, so I don't think, pretend that this doesn't happen. I think a debate is a good wow. thing. And so that if, if there's a, a, an interesting conversation that comes of this, I think it's positive. If it just is, is, is more chatter, there's nothing positive that comes I of agree, it. I agree, Laura. Yeah, so let's hope, something is, good, I, let's hope something good comes of this. Now, I want to get to another issue, guys. I want to get your take on this national anthem protest because it's reigniting now in the NFL. Of course, last night, uh, really cool, uh, fun preseason games. A handful of players took knees or raised their fists during the anthem. Now, the president, I guess not surprisingly, tweeted out today in part Quote, numerous players from different teams wanted to show their outrage at something that most of them are unable to define. They make a fortune doing what they love, find another way to protest. Eric, your reaction to that? Because, you know, you have Kenny Stills out there saying, look at my Twitter feed. You know, look at my Twitter feed. I explain why I'm doing what I'm doing. Look at my social media. It's not just a whim. I mean this. And he's sticking up for his right to do what he does. And I think that the, when we speak about bullying in politics, I mean, we have the biggest bully in the in the White <laughs> House right now, given the fact that this situation has turned on racial lines in, this, in the fact that by trying to make it about the military, the players have been very adamant over and over, it is not about the military. Some of them have fathers, uncles, brothers, mothers, sisters who have served in the military. It is about bringing attention to the racial injustices that are, have been systematically done by the police and other instruments of government in this case. Now, I do agree yeah. that there may be a need for their their method of protest to transform to a more economic and more political base, similar to what we just saw happen in St. Louis, where the prosecutor was defeated by a Democratic, a more progressive uh, opponent. Maybe some of these athletes should now take their protest to the polling places yeah. to draw people out, to the vote NFL, out some of these people, the prosecutors, the, the district NFL's attorneys, yeah. the people, who, the judges. Okay. Who yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think, Eric, Kevin, hold on. Eric, I think, Eric, I think what people, no one says... People don't have the right. They have the right to do whatever they want, say whatever they want. First Amendment, cool, more speech is better. All that's fine. I think what some of the fans feel like is where everything is so infected with politics. Can we have uh, some areas where we can all just get together and root for our teams without having to get into a political thing? I think that's what more people are kind of irked by, not the fact that they're speaking out, but that they want just one zone where it's no politics. But Kevin, maybe I'm off well, base. Your no, I, think that, I think that's part of it, but the idea that it became racial because of Donald Trump is the president is ridiculous. He was protecting the flag, America first, make America great again. He pointed out the inconsistencies in the Black Lives Matter movement and, and the fact that these guys are, it really was more well, self uh, well, what about the inconsistencies me, with the finish? All Lives Matter and the Blue finish. Lives Matter movement? It, the, I mean, the, the, the fact, fact of the is, matter is it was yeah, a self was Kevin, it was a self-indulgent move by Colin Kaepernick, and he's hurting the league, and people understand that. And, and look, you can, you can try to make this black and white. The same problems that were persisting in the community, so-called policing issues, were happening during the time of Obama. Why didn't somebody take a knee then? They waited till Donald Trump so that he could be the person no. to do it? If well, who said, who so said he waited until Donald Trump? Trump? The fact well, is, when, when, this, been, when it got yeah, to a point where they felt that time. they had to sue something about it, it yeah. just coincided All with right, Donald guys. Trump. I right, guys, but the question you. is, if, yeah. Obama, if this had happened while Obama yeah. was president, do you think that he would take the same position that Donald Trump is? The of course the, not. The, the no, no, no. He wouldn't um, have, he, he wouldn't have at all. I think, yeah, you're right about that, Eric. He would have su probably supported the players and what they're doing. But the, uh, the owners have this policy in place, and they've kind of put that on the shelf now. They're hoping they can figure this out. Uh, guys, have a great weekend. And have you noticed recently how often... Some liberals now favorably invoke Ronald Reagan to make a left-wing political point. A Reagan cabinet member and a biographer reveal the truth next. And later, outrage mounting over the horrific sexual assault of a five-year-old girl by an illegal immigrant in Philly. The U.S. attorney for the area will join us exclusively on why he's laying blame with city officials. Have you noticed how the Trump presidency is spawning a lot of bizarre trends on the left? But one of them would have been unthinkable until just a short time ago. Ronald Reagan is suddenly in vogue with liberals. Now, if only the 40, the president was alive to hear their praise. Joining me now, 
With more on this is Bill Bennett, who served as Secretary of Ed Education uh, under President Reagan. I worked for him, full disclosure, and is also a Fox News contributor, along with Craig Shirley, the author of four bestsellers on Ronald Reagan, including Reagan Rising. Great to see both of you. All right, Bill, I find this to be fascinating, that we now have all these liberals coming out and saying, well, the, the Trump folks, and on any given number of issues, gosh, if only they were more like Reagan. Well, how, how do you uh, process this today? Yeah, well, it's uh, kind of funny, isn't it? Uh, a rosy memory uh, changing the way things were. I don't remember it being very pleasant back then, uh, serving with Ronald Reagan, with the liberals, with the media. There's a line of Shakespeare, though, that says, you know, he's good being God. Uh, but one has to say, whatever criticisms came down during the Reagan era, and there were a lot of them, uh, I got some, uh, you derivatively got some, you were working for me, as you said, Ronald Reagan got plenty, uh, it's nothing compared to what Donald Trump is getting. So if they can use Ronald Reagan uh, to beat up Donald Trump, they will do it, and they can do it with a straight face. I don't know how they pull off the straight face. Uh, Craig, you always remind us of this fact that the left will do anything to regain power, even invoking sure. the political figure they thought were it was basically the enemy. I want to play some flashback sound from some of our favorites in the media, and I believe this was uh, uh, during the administration, right after the president, uh, yeah, right after he passed away. Let's watch. Did his vision include extraordinary deficits? Did his, in, in, in his vision include uh, cutting the budgets for education and, and, and uh, back of the hand in terms of... Are you uh, saying, Morley, his, history will not be education. kind to him? I don't, no, I, I don't think history particularly will be kind. I don't think history has any reason to be kind to him. I used to say, I thought if you were down on your luck and you got through the Secret Service, got in the Oval Office, and Mr. President, I'm down on my luck, he would literally give you the shirt off his back. And then he'd sit down in his undershirt and he'd sign legislation throwing your kids off school lunch program, maybe your parents off Social Security. He wanted Grandma to eat Alpo. Remember that, guys, uh, Craig? Yeah, right. This uh, is uh, unbelievable. Yeah, and, ketchup, and ketchup was a, a vegetable, too. Look, this is a pattern right. that plays itself out actually many times, Laura. You know, when Eisenhower was president, liberals derided him. They said uh, Dwight Eisenhower couldn't read if his lips were chapped. Then he becomes a paragon of virtue. Barry Goldwater was, was attacked by psychiatrists and newspapers and denounced as crazy. Now he's held up by liberals as a paragon of virtue. The left hated uh, Richard Nixon. I saw, I saw a uh, liberal historian on MSNBC the other day actually favor Richard Nixon comparably to Donald Trump. Gerald Ford, both Bushes were all hated by uh, the left until they were no longer in office. Then they become convenient tools to bash the current occupant of the, op of the uh, White House. So right. it's, it's nothing new, especially, but it's especially infuriating with Reagan because uh, th they know nothing about the Reagan. As I said earlier to you this morning, Laura, I said they're in over their head. They don't know what they're talking about. And we all worked for President Reagan, and we yes. all know that on the issue, for instance, of immigration, a lot of Democrats are out there saying, well, the Republican Party, Donald Trump, uh, they, you know, they, they're getting, you know, if only, again, they were more like Reagan on immigration. So let's play a few of the choice sound bites from President Reagan on immigration. The simple truth is that we've lost control of our own borders, and no nation can do that and survive. I've spoken of a shining city all my political life. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, windswept, God-blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. If there had to be city walls, the walls had doors, and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. Bill? You can take a take a yeah. hit at that one. It, it's so. It's first of all, I get so I get shivers every time I hear him speak. But talk about the city on the hill. The city had walls. It would have a door, and you know. And so the left takes that part of the city on the hill. Anyone can come. See, Ronald Reagan wanted everyone to come, but then of course they forget the part about the wall and the part about the uh, you know country without borders isn't a country. Yeah. Once again, he's good being gone. You know, it occurred to me while while you were talking to Craig. Uh, maybe uh, two, three, four elections in the future, we will see videotape of Donald Trump saying, and the liberals saying, now those were the days when people had heart and soul. <laughs> and, I mean, you know, I don't I mean, think so. Just the thought, exp 
Just a Maybe. thought experiment here, Laura. You know, can it possibly? You know, can it be worse uh, till it gets worse. You know, but but no, this Bill is amazing. There's so right. much. Uh, yeah, no, but there's so much uh, the two share in common. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, Craig was saying the other day, or maybe I read it in his book, that this commitment to defense, to a defense buildup, which is so essential to both of them. Uh, the focus on a wall. Reagan wanted to tear one down, the right one, and Trump wants to build one up, and that's and that's the right one too. But uh, you know, they're very different personalities, uh, and yet uh, very much going in the same direction. Seems to be the thing. I think I'd be interested in Craig's opinion on this, having served in the cabinet and proudly for Ronald Reagan. I think this is a more conservative cabinet than Ronald Reagan had, don't you, Craig? Yeah, I think so. But it's also you know, don't forget, Bill, is that. You know, the uh, bench, you know, you were, you were a great conservative in the cabinet, and uh, William French Smith, and of course Ed Meese, but the bench was a lot thinner. This is a byproduct of the Reagan presidency, is, is that Good point. there's a lot more talent now to be available for yep. the Trump uh, administration that wasn't available in 1980. Yeah, and, and think right. about that. Think of all the people that were waiting in the wings to get appointed to the appellate courts. I mean, all those 50-something yeah. year olds, for, late 40s, yeah. Yeah. they were they were children of the Reagan era, were they not, Bill? I mean, it changed. I mean, yes. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. I mean, the left would probably love that if it weren't for Reagan. I mean, well, if it didn't work for you, I would I wouldn't be doing any of this. No, the AAA and AA leagues uh, very much uh, pop, highly populated then with the right people. I remember Laura at our at our place. Remember we got known as Fort Reagan at one point. There were <laughs> we had 134 <laughs> political appointees, and I remember Senator Weicker, who was supposed to be a Republican, said, "What are you doing yeah. with all these political appointees?" And I said, I, th "I think we're doing it right. You know, we won. We won. We won the election, and that was a great training camp. And it's interesting to see where a lot of those people have gone." Famous television personalities. Such yeah, as all right. Well, Bill, you can, I can do, they can blame you. They can blame you. All right, guys, thanks so much. And the so called <laughs> blue wave for Democrats may already be fizzling out. Why? Well, good old Nancy Pelosi. Details after this. We are advocates and defenders. We are champions and friends. We are deep sea divers and river riders. We are scientists and researchers, and so much more. We are the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, 230 strong accredited members who go to work every day to ensure the conservation of our precious wildlife in their home and in our care. Visit aza.org slash join us. At Visiting Angels, we understand the importance of family. This history, this bond, this commitment, this love. What we hold most sacred are the people we care for, our loved ones and yours. Whether you're nearby or miles away, you can be confident that we treat and care for your family like it's our own. Visiting Angels, America's choice in senior home care. If your moderate to severe ulcerative colitis or Crohn's symptoms are holding you back and your current treatment hasn't worked well enough, it may be time for a change. Ask your doctor about Intivio, the only biologic developed and approved just for UC and Crohn's. Intivio works at the site of inflammation in the GI tract and is clinically proven to help many patients achieve both symptom relief and remission. Infusion and serious allergic reactions can happen during or after treatment. Intivio may increase risk of infection, which can be serious. PML, a rare, serious, potentially fatal brain infection caused by a virus, may be possible. This condition has not been reported with Intivio. Tell your doctor if you have an infection, experience frequent infections, or have flu-like symptoms or sores. Liver problems can occur with Intivio. If your UC or Crohn's treatment isn't working for you, ask your gastroenterologist about Intivio. Intivio, relief and remission within reach. Thanks to Nancy Pelosi, the so-called blue wave may be fading out a little bit. The divisive House Minority Leader is becoming the shining star of the GOP attack ads leading up to the midterms. Here's a little sample. Failed liberal politician Paul Davis is at it again, but this time he's running for Congress, and this time he's not alone. Now Nancy Pelosi and her Washington Democrats are bankrolling his campaign, because Davis's record in Topeka is the Pelosi agenda in Washington. A vote for Paul Davis is a vote for Nancy Pelosi. And Democratic House candidates and members apparently smell blood. 
dozens of them and counting will not commit or outright they refuse to support Pelosi continuing as the Democrats' House leader. Joining us now to analyze, Fox News contributor Rachel Campos Duffy and Teslin Figaro, the national, former National Racial Justice Director for Bernie Sanders. All right, Teslin, let's talk to you. I mean, I think all parties have their person who you kind of want to move on. And it's just the way it is. The Republicans have had the same uh, issue, you know, and not so much with Boehner, but it, the Republicans wanted him to move on, and ultimately he did. What do you see, though, with you have this incredible number of Democrat incumbents, now it's at 51, who say, uh-uh, will not support her? Well, it's funny you ask me what do I see because, you know, I feel like I'm a prophet because on just last week I prophesied <laughs> that the blue wave would certainly, uh, someone was bound to drown. So just call me Noah, Laura. Um, you know, at the at the end of the day, um, people are ready to move on. You know, it's not just Democrats who are also saying they want to get rid of uh, Nancy Pelosi, but also Republicans and independents as, as well. Three quarter of, of Americans have polled to say that it, the time is over for Nancy Pelosi. So, you know, I, it's really sad because poor Tim Ryan, um, when he tried to run against uh, Nancy in 2016, people thought that it was a joke. So we've seen over 20 Democrat leaders say that they were not in support with her in June, and now look at where in August, and now it's over 50 um, who are asking Nancy to move on. So it kind of just reminds me of that old stalker girlfriend that just refuses, <laughs> you know, to stop calling the phone over and over repeatedly and just oh. understand that the relationship is over. Okay, Tesla cracks me up. <laughs> all right, Tesla, I needed to laugh on Friday, and that cracks me up. All right, Rachel, I, first of all, the Republicans kind of putting all their eggs eggs and the anti-Pelosi basket. I mean, I think they have such a great agenda on, on the economy, the co economic you know, prosperity, relative peace out there. I, don't, I mean, I, the Pelosi thing seems a, gets, gets a little old uh, for me, but nevertheless, I guess well, it, it's kind of it, good, I guess, but it's, I don't, don't both parties have these people who just refuse to move on? Well, you can walk and chew gum. You can tout all the good news um, that the Republicans and Donald Trump agenda has brought about in their districts. And you can remind voters that, make no mistake, I don't care what those 50 Democrats are saying, if the Democrats take control of Congress, Nancy Pelosi will be the leader of the House. Democrats fall in step all the time, and she will be the 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 leader and by the way she embodies everything middle americans hate about washington she represents san francisco loony policies that have never worked um, and the republicans are back home they're, by the way they're kind of enthusiastic now i mean i don't think they were feeling so good a month ago they're feeling pretty yeah. good right now they're back home they're seeing the impact of their agenda they're talking to constituents and face to face reminding them of who brought them about who said it was going to be Armageddon, Nancy Pelosi, and who called their bonuses? All right, they're uh, personalizing come. it. Yeah, they're personalizing Absolutely. it. They and, they're, and they're working hard back in their districts. Yeah, they have to personalize the message. Just like you know, Obama and the Democrats did, you have to personalize it. Speaking of the real clear politics average, let's put it up on the screen. Uh, it's today the Democrats have a 5% advantage, but a month ago they had an 8.2% advantage. Um, Bloomberg opinion uh, headline, by the way, it kind of extends this conversation on this. Pelosi is the wrong target for Democrats. Uh, Joe Cunningham saying uh, the Democratic Party needs new leadership now. If elected, I will not vote for Nancy Pelosi as speaker. Time to move forward and win again. 34 Democratic nominees now say they are neither for nor against Pelosi, but 42 of the party's nominees say they will not support Nancy Pelosi. Well, who, who has the juice, though, Teslin, to take on Pelosi? Let's say the Democrats are able to pick up all the seats they need to take the majority. You know, you gotta have, the, you gotta have something to beat, uh, not, you can't beat exactly. uh, something with nothing. Who, who beats Pelosi? Well, you know, it, it's it's amazing, um, you know, that they continue to keep uh, pushing Nancy Pelosi on people. And it's amazing that she won't sit down. You know, a lot has changed in the last two years. I really don't know the answer to the question. I would like to see if they would like to support uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. They claim to love black girl magic. You know, let's see if they're willing to put someone uh, who's actually <laughs> African-American female in, in office. But I guess right. they will probably be going well, to stretch. Um, I want more right. Maxine Waters. I want Maxine Waters as a, as a Speaker of the House because I, I need <laughs> I, Auntie Maxine. I like I actually I think she's 
is kind of fun. I mean, she's, she doesn't like Trump very much, but she makes politics interesting. Okay, we're going to put it very well, nicely on Friday. All right, we're out of time, Laura guys. Sorry, is, uh, well, we're out of time, but we'll continue this conversation got it. on radio next week. Thanks, guys. Have a great weekend. Philadelphia sanctuary policies are slammed after a five-year-old girl sexually assaulted by an illegal alien. The U.S. attorney for Philly says enough is enough. He joins us with his plans to take on local officials next. Philadelphia's sanctuary city status is under intense fire after the brutal rape of a five-year-old girl by an illegal immigrant. And the U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, which oversees Philly, says he's had enough. William McSwain recently sat down with us about his efforts to fight back against the city's sanctuary policies and their devastating consequences. Mr. McSwain, thank you for joining us. Good to have you with us. So. You're a U.S. attorney in a very important city of Philadelphia, and there is a big controversy there, as you uh, are, are acutely aware of, involving the sanctuary status of Philadelphia. Tell me why, from your perspective, and then we're going to get into the specific case, why your perspective, sanctuary status, is harmful for public safety. Well, fundamentally, um, those of us in law enforcement aren't supposed to play favorites. Those of us who are prosecutors aren't supposed to play favorites. That's a fundamental principle because we are supposed to enforce the rule of law, and that means that we're supposed to enforce the law in a fair, nonpartisan manner. The problem with sanctuary cities is they sort of turn that whole principle on its head and they politicize law enforcement. How do you mean? I mean that what they stand for, they stand for the proposition that a certain group of people are not going to be subject to our laws for political purposes. Namely, we're talking about illegal immigrants. Well, th they make the opposite claim. Um, those who are defending the sanctuary city policies, including the mayor and his boosters, Mayor Kenny and his boosters, they'll say, actually, sanctuary status keeps the place safer because illegal immigrants won't go to the authorities otherwise because they're going to be afraid of being deported. So it actually makes the city less safe if you don't have a sanctuary policy in place. How do you respond to that? I think actually they have it exactly backwards. They do say that they think that it um, fosters trust among the community and law enforcement in order to not enforce immigration laws, but actually I think what fosters trust between the community and law enforcement is when the community knows that law enforcement is not going to play favorites. If they know that the rule of law is going to be respected, the broader community therefore um, believes that law enforcement is doing their job. So when the proponents of sanctuary cities make that argument that you just articulated, I think they have it exactly backwards. Well, uh, the DA of Philadelphia, Larry Krasner, he is not too pleased with your criticism of the sanctuary city policy. He said ab about your statement um, a linking this rape uh, by this uh, Juan Ramon Vasquez, who was released, ended up raping a member of his own family, a five-year-old uh, child. He said, well, that's very dramatic to somehow link the sanctuary status to this rape. The Trump administration has made it so that immigrant children can get raped because they're afraid to call the police due to its policies of deporting people who are victims. So they're linking Trump to you, the deportation of actual victims of domestic violence, and you're seeing this bubble up with the, the judge versus uh, Jeff Sessions yesterday. Uh, so how do you respond to that? Now, he's hitting you hard, saying you're just basically, this is typical Trump administration stuff from you. I think that fundamentally the problem with that statement is that statement is a political statement. He's going political. I am doing my best as a law enforcement officer to enforce the law in a neutral, nonpartisan, apolitical manner. And when you are a proponent of sanctuary cities, you're actually, again, you're politicizing law enforcement. I think that the DA in Philadelphia, unfortunately, takes a political approach to a lot of issues in law enforcement. And what I'm saying is that respect for the rule of law is a nonpartisan. But they say neutral. we're not the immigration uh, force. We're not a federal immigration force. We have our hands full already. Well, the fundamental problem, again, is that not only are sanctuary cities, in my view, wrong, but they're essentially un-American. Let me, let me explain that a little bit. Um, when you come before the law in America, it's not supposed to matter who you are or where you're from 
or who your parents are or the like, everybody is supposed to be treated equally. So if you politicize the law and you say, we're not going to enforce the law against a certain group of people, we're only going to enforce it against others, you're essentially uh, doing something that I believe is un-American because you're not respecting the rule of it's law. It's not equal justice under the law. Correct. Juan Ramon Vasquez, let's get back to that case. Uh, 2014, he was arrested on an aggravated assault. He was released. He's a legal immigrant. Uh, a year and a half later, he was, con he was found to have raped uh, a member of his own family, a five-year-old uh, little girl. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the, you know, when, when he's released in 2014, uh, that was sanctuary city time, and uh, they say, well, making that leap from his release to the rape and sanctuary policies, that's unfair. Do you squarely, obviously it's his fault for doing the rape, he's liable, but did the sanctuary city policy facilitate the rape of this little girl? And not only facilitate it, it's 100% responsible for it, and that is non-controversial. What happened in the timeline was Mr. Vasquez was deported in 2009. He then illegally re-entered the country. He was arrested for assault in 2014, and we placed a detainer on him, which is a request that if he's released from local custody, they give the feds a heads up, we take him into federal custody, and we deport him. Unfortunately, Philadelphia, because they are a sanctuary city, do not respect detainers. So when Mr. Vasquez was released in 2014, we didn't know about it. The Philadelphia uh, prison officials didn't tell us about it, and instead of him coming into federal custody where he would have been deported to Honduras and had no opportunity to commit any further crimes in Philadelphia, instead he went into the community and, as you said, he raped a five-year-old. Uh, Mayor Kenny, you might have seen this video one or two or three times, reacted to that uh, court ruling that affirm the ability to have this sanctuary status without any federal uh, you know, diminution in funding. And he did the big Snoopy dance. Let's watch. A sanctuary city. Yeah. A sanctuary city. Yeah. So he's thrilled that they could cut off access to the feds to the city arrest database. So the federal government could not get any, even if they wanted to get access in this sanctuary policy, they could not have access even to know who's in, who's in, the, who's in the state pen. Correct. And one of the larger sort of issues at stake here is that in the post-9-11 world, it's very, very important that all levels of law enforcement, state, local, federal, that they're talking to each other. I thought that's what the point. I thought after 9-11, everyone was supposed to talk to each other. Obviously, FBI, CIA. But aren't we all supposed to be working together as Americans to keep our communities, our country safe? I, I don't. I really do not understand the sanctuary stuff. I don't. Well, the I don't get it. The problem is, prior to 9-11, a lot of law enforcement were in silos. They weren't talking to each other. They weren't communicating. We've made a lot of progress since then. And I think that having, for example, a sanctuary city policy where the locals are not communicating with the federal authorities and are, in fact, defying federal law is a step backwards. And we do that at our own peril. Now, you're not a political figure, but you live in Philadelphia. You live in the area. What is your sense about the constituents? I mean, minorities, the poor, the disadvantaged are the ones who are victimized the most by recidivist illegal immigrant crime. Any sense about how they're feeling about this mayor? Again, I think that what people want is they want to know that their law enforcement officers, whether they're federal or local or state, are enforcing the rule of law in a nonpartisan, fair manner, treating everybody fairly. And it is fundamentally un-American and fundamentally unfair to not enforce the law against an entire population. Any sense about these uh, nationwide injunctions, the sanctuary city uh, defund, you know, that was one federal district court ruling. We have other individual federal district court rulings uh, on immigration. Well, first of all, on that Sanctuary Cities case that you mentioned earlier, the last word hasn't been written on that. There was a case in the Eastern District of Pennsylvania, my district, that was ruled on, but there's lots of these cases going on around the country, and they all sort of percolate their way up to the court They're system. They're supposed to. There shouldn't be a nationwide injunction with one district court judge, or should there be? No, there shouldn't. And um, what you want is you want several courts to look at an issue, have the benefit of all of their analysis, and eventually these things hopefully make their way to the Supreme Court, which will have the final word. Are you having fun as U.S. Attorney of Philadelphia? It's a pretty cool job. It's, uh, it's a lot of work, but yes, I'm, I'm doing my best enjoying it. Thank you, Mr. McSane. Great to, great to see you. Thank you Thank so much. You. We appreciate the U.S. Attorney joining us and the job he's doing. We'll be right back. Thank you to all you fans out there. Wasn't this a fun week? 
We're going to be right back here Monday night, of course. In the meantime, have a wonderful weekend. Not many summer weekends left, so enjoy your families and your friends. I know I will. Ed Henry is in for Miss Shannon Bream. He and the Fox News at Night team are up next. Have a great weekend, everyone. Good night from Washington.